if we, over the next five, 10 years, dial the world towards fewer fossil fuels, we agree that will probably be a, a lower growth, poorer, more regulated, more authoritarian, less free world. And if you uh, dial it to, um, to higher fossil fuel production and consumption, we will have, you know, we'll have a better world on a you know, horizon of the next decade. Sort of in our analysis of what happens at the margins, as you do somewhat more, somewhat less, I think we're, we're in very violent agreement. I think uh, a lot of the specific arguments about you know, how environmentalism has been you know, hijacked in this you know, very uh, anti-science, anti-future, anti-human way, I, I'm incredibly sympathetic to you. Probably the, you know, you know, there's sort of a lot of subtle disagreements, but if I had to summarize them, it, 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 I, I, I don't think that it is somehow the panacea for all of our problems. There are sort of ways that uh, we, we can't, we cannot just rely on fossil fuels to get, get to the future. And that's not exactly what you say, but there is some sense in which uh, we need to do things that are very different. If I had to maybe concretize this with some intuitive numbers, you know, the U.S. has 330 million, 340 million people. The world's about 8 billion, you know, something like 25 times the U.S. population. And you know, I'm not sure what the exact number is. U.S. consumes maybe 15, 16 million barrels a day of oil. Uh, so 25 times that would be 400 million. The mm -hmm. world consumes 100 million barrels of oil a day. If we said that it was, there should be, you know, um, some ideal future where the world gets to, the rest of the world gets to the U.S. standards of living. Our living standards go up, but let's say the rest of the world deserves to, should, and help converge to U.S. living standards. I don't think 400 million barrels a day is achievable. I don't think there's enough oil. I, I think if you actually try to produce that much, you know, the money would flow to all the wrong people in the Middle East, other places. There are all sorts of crazy things that so, would so do you, But do you take so me as, do, do you take me as, because you mentioned that I sort of said this, but then, so, so like, do you take that as my argument that we should be using 400 million? Am I not disavowing that enough? I, I, take, I take your argument and mine to be in agreement that if we go from 100 million barrels a day and we have a choice, do we go to 110 or do we go to 90? Surely the world where we go to 110 is better than the world where we go to 90. So well, most most people are saying we should go way below 90. Way below that, but let's. I'm, just, I'm just doing the the Got marginal. Because mar right, so at the, the marginal argument. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and of course, yeah, people say we should go down fast, but in practice, they're we're going to go down slowly or up, up slowly. I think that even going to 110, 120 is 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 not going to be is not going to be enough, and that's why in my my way of thinking about the energy future, much more of the weight does have to be put on alternatives. Uh, I, I probably put, put, would always put the stress on nuclear power, maybe fusion power. Uh, those were what I th think were supposed to be the energy sources mm -hmm. of the 21st century. And uh, that's what's, what's really gone wrong. You know, if we, if we don't get nuclear or fusion, yeah, we're not gonna make up for it with solar or windmills, and we're gonna have to you know, increase oil and natural gas and, and that sort of production for the next decades. But, uh, but I don't think it will be enough to ever get India, uh, you know, the emerging market countries to get to a US standard of living. Resources are created and they're potentially limitless. Like I really do think of the world as a ball of matter and energy. The more knowledge we get about how to manipulate it, how to transform it, the more we can, we can harness. And this tends to open up very big new frontiers. And so in general, the argument isn't, well, we're gonna to get to 400 million, dollar, 400 million barrels a day of oil, but maybe it's, we, but it's that there's some form of energy that we can harness if we're free, and that the way to get to nuclear is to be using more fossil fuels and to have more freedom. I'm always hesitant to be quite as abstract as you are here. So I think you have- Well, I wanted to make it concrete. So, um, but but the, the concrete where, where I would be skeptical is I, I'm not sure there is a limitless amount of oil, I'm not sure um, there's a limitless amount of relatively cheap oil. So if you were to double the oil production, I think that would that would cost a lot more. And uh, I, I think I think you do you do have some kind of resource limits to growth. Well, but or, then or, or very strange things happen. If you take the pre-oil history, where um, you know 19th century was powered by coal, and there was some limit to a coal economy, by uh, Britain in 1910 1911. You know, there were 15 million people in the workforce, 1 million were working in the coal mines, and it got, and somehow the marginal cost reduction went up, and it, it finally hit a trigger point where the coal workers all went on strike, the Labor Party got created, 
and the whole, uh, the whole political economy of the UK shifted radically to the left. And, uh, and so if you, had a, if you had an overly cornucopian view of coal, which was the free market view in the late 19th, early 20th century, you didn't see that labor strike coming and you didn't see the way in which the UK would become a socialist country. Energy in the abstract, there's, there, there are alternate sources we can develop. Um, there's, no, no reason we, there's no reason that there are any hard limits on, on oil specifically. I'm not so sure it's different from coal. Coal is super easy to get. It has many advantages over oil in terms of discovery and production. Oil, you gotta find these, I love oil, but coal is just, it's there, it's easily accessible. So if we have the technology to really p refine coal, I think that's a huge potential breakthrough. And then with natural gas, you know, if methane hydrates under the ocean, we can potentially liquefy those. So I think that we need to be more open to resource creation, both within the realm of hydrocarbons, not, not limiting ourselves to, oh, it has to be liquid when it comes out of the ground. It just needs to be liquid when we use it. And then if you go even more broadly, well, with other things like nuclear, you could synthesize hydrocarbons in different ways. And then I think people tend to have a frozen view of nuclear. They just think, oh, it's just the light water reactors. It's just this one thing. I think where we're in common is we both want the policies where these things can proliferate. But I, I do tend, even people in the oil industry, they tend to narrowly think, oh, you can't go to $400 million a barrel a day, but maybe you could go to 400 million of liquid hydrocarbon using all of these different options. We'd have to drill down on those numbers a lot where there is, there are probably forms of pollution you get from coal, not just the carbon dioxide emission, but um, you know, well, with these, these processes, ways, you, you, you actually eliminate those at the beginning because you're refining it. If, yeah, it's always a question, you know, it, it, there was you know, a very coal intensive economy, a la China is polluted. You know, it's a horrifically polluted country and it's not the CO2. By, it's by all, our, by our standards, yeah. Um, not compared to what we used to live in. But. And, and I, I, th I think, um, and so I do think, I, I do think there's probably, you know, my, my intuition is that there are some resource constraints and if you, if you don't get to the resource constraints, you, you get to some kind of pollution constraint, which is why I, I don't think um, the hydrocarbon piece by itself will work. Even though th those, are the, those are the variables we'd, we'd have to drill down on. I think at the margin, you know, at the, at the margin, it would be good to do somewhat more. I think the realistic debate is between somewhat more and somewhat less. It's not between you know, 400 million and zero, it's you know, 110 versus 90. And in terms of the realistic place where, where, where that might go, you know, we're, we're, we're very much in agreement. It would be best for them if the other people dialed back even more than they did. If everybody dials back in a coordinate way, coordinated way, that's also possibly a really a good outcome because of these weird inelasticities. I mean, something, something like this happened with the tobacco industry yeah, where, where after, you know, after the giant tobacco settlement in the late 1990s, um, before that, the government was anti-tobacco. So if you were anti-government, maybe you were pro-tobacco because, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend or something like this. You know, after the settlement, the whole industry has been cartelized in a crazy way where I think the numbers in the U.S., it's 25 cents to produce a pack of cigarettes. They sell it for $4 because there only are the three tobacco companies that were party to the settlement that get to sell tobacco. And the government uh, adds another two and a half bucks in taxes. And so it's a, it's a cartel that somehow works for the government tax collectors Plus, um, plus the t tobacco companies, and somehow the, the subtle effect of the settlement was they switched sides from being this, let's say, anti-government thing to, um, to sort of a, an extension of the state. It's certainly, certainly my, my instinct, and may, maybe it's too facile on my part, but it's always my instinct that when people, if people are concerned about climate change, all these things, if they're not wildly pro-nuclear, I, um, I'm always biased to think they're simply acting out of bad faith. We can double our economy and we can double the population. And um, it's, it's like the uh, Dustin Hoffman movie from the late 60s, The Graduate. And, you know, he gets told, okay, what you're supposed to go into is plastics. And, and that was plastics were the future in 1955. And by 1968, yeah, maybe we needed more plastics, but it-, it Yeah, it, we sure it, as hell needed more plastics in 1968. But, but it all felt- you know, there, there was a way in which this this felt exhausted. I, you know, I, I was, you know, I was I was a kid in the '70s, and I remember, you know, I remember being in LA, and it was, you know, it was it was really polluted, and it was get, the pollution was getting it was steadily getting worse. There was some sense that you couldn't be on this thing. Now, I, I think what happened was 
you know, it, it pivoted way too far in this dialing it back direction. But what I'm saying like the other, but part of this will go, maybe we should talk about human flourishing in a minute, but this, what I'm saying is that the pro-freedom side isn't owning the issue of environment, but part of it means, means valuing it properly. So if you talk mm -hmm. about economics in a vacuum and you just say, okay, we wanna produce more and more and more. We just, all we wanna do is produce more sure. and more and more, but it's not, you're not looking at life in a holistic way then you run into the challenge of, well, some people will take a huge aspect of life, like environmental quality, natural beauty, they'll own that and they'll say, oh, there's this dichotomy. And so you guys, you guys just want LA to become more polluted. Whereas I would say that the truly freedom position is no, no, no. As we become more evolved technologically, we can have higher and higher pollution standards because we have the technological and economic ability to set them, unlike the caveman where you can't set pollution standards for him because all he can live by mm -hmm. is fire. But if we, um, but is, is anything holistic? Isn't that, is, uh, you know, is, is holism, like you're flourishing, yeah. human flourishing, isn't that just a code word for statism? Because um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like, when, when you say, you know, we need to be holistic about things, it's yeah. like we need to take the big picture, we need to take into account, not just the shareholders, but all the stakeholders. Right. And then we're, we're in, you know, European social democracy where companies don't exist to make profits. That's too narrow, that's not holistic enough. And that becomes the all purpose excuse for, um, you know, this ever larger, ever more intrusive um, a state getting its, you know, it's the camel's nose under the tent or whatever. Well, there's a question. Of, well, let's first talk so about that, it. So I just have an allergic reaction no, I, I to understand. I have an allergic but, but, reaction but, but I, to But I think, well, but I think that, that some others have an allergic reaction. I think that's an impediment. So, but let's just talk, let's talk about it individually and then ha how to handle it societally. Because individually, presumably you're not against holism, right? It's not like, like you have different things like family, friends, like you want a life that's integrated and that has different aspects to it that hopefully fit together, it's not just, you're not optimizing one aspect to the exclusion of everything um, else. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but we're here, here, I think we're talking about public policy. But, and, but, 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 then, but, it, but it starts, right. But, but you have to acknowledge that people think about their, they're first and foremost thinking about their lives and they're thinking about their lives holistically. So then there's a question of how to account for that in public policy. And I think the main way is defining rights properly, but rights have to, I mean, just take pollution. So, how do you decide what standards to set for pollution? It has to factor in the need for production in human life. That's a fundamental need. And it also has to factor in, well, at a certain level of pollution, it interferes with people living their lives. And that's why I think you, you know, different areas even can set legitimately different pollution standards. But I think properly they are thinking of the lives of the citizens in a holistic way. That's different from saying, like one dictator should factor in, a, should should think holistically about everyone and treat everyone as expendable. But it's like, how do you set the conditions for individuals to flourish? Uh, surely, and I, th I think we would agree on a lot of the particulars, um, but uh, but it's not as simple as just saying you have these rights in a vacuum. You know, if, it, it, if, we, if we're gonna regulate carbon emissions, it's probably best to do it with a carbon trading market because a market's still a better way I would agree with that. than a non-market. Although in practice, um, you, if you have an international carbon trading market, you know, do you end up with a situation where Nigeria is exporting carbon credits for all the trees it's planting in the Sahara Desert and that it never even plants? And you end up, you know, um, you, and then you need, and then in practice you need, you know, some fairly powerful governmental monitoring schemes and you end up with a very top heavy state to well, make the, it really The work. carbon thing is, yeah, the carbon thing so is example, a mess. I'm saying say theoretically, but we'll take it more locally, right? Because you can have it with just more local air pollution where I think a rights-based theory would say, yeah, there, we determine there's a certain threshold at which like given the state of technology and resources and stuff, we like, this is the amount of emissions we want in LA on a given day. And I think there, like you can set and so you sort of set a threshold and then you have to decide sort of how do people get to contribute to that? Maybe it's, maybe it's all the existing cars. The, 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 the local version of this that I'm, I'm very focused on where things seem incredibly off to me, incredibly hard to fix are just basic zoning laws. And, um, and you know, the, the naive version would be you have a house, you have some property, you should be able to build more um, you should be able to de develop it. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have control over that. And then in practice, 
those property rights have been massively dialed back by zoning laws. And there's some complicated trade-off argument because, you know, if you build a 20-story skyscraper on your, in your, to replace your single-family house, it'll cast too much of a shadow on the neighbors. Right. And, and then, um, but then in practice, it's, it's not that we have these rights that get freely traded or somehow uh, adjudicated by the market. In practice, we end up with 